Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 256. Managing failure. This vlog is paying back a debt to one of my remarkable former students, Dr. Narelle Hunter. Hi Narelle. Narelle in our astonishing Christmas vlog stated that we all should talk more about failure and I took that understanding very seriously and today we're going to do that. Narelle, we're going to talk about failure but you'll notice the vlog itself is called Managing Failure and this is going to be part of a failure trilogy. <laughs> we're going to start with Managing Failure. The second vlog in the series is Understanding Success and the final vlog comes via request. I was challenged to do a vlog around a particular phrase. If not now, then when? So let's do our failure trilogy. How buoyant and optimistic. And there is a reason why this is such a challenging topic for PhD students. Because PhD students are failure averse. And look, I understand managing reviewer too is tough enough. And because failure is so debilitating to PhD students, they would prefer to leave the program than actually confront failure. So this is a thing. And there are many ways to avoid failure in a PhD. One of them is attrition by leave the program. But there's lots of others too. Blaming, complaining, grievance culture. All of these variables are other solutions too. So yes, I didn't fail. That person over there, they failed, right? Now we all have bad days, bad weeks, bad months. And yes, we all have incredibly bad years. You might be in the middle of one. And you may ask yourself why a friend of yours is able to pick themselves up and dust themselves off and move on and you sort of sit weeping uncontrollably in the failure. And why is that happening? Now, they're not any better or greater than you. But what's happened is that person over there has developed some strategies that you don't have not to avoid paper, pa failure, not to avoid failure, not to deny failure, but to manage failure. So this vlog is about managing failure. Both those words are important. And I am going to offer 10 strategies to get you through failure. 10 ideas, some may work for you, some may not. But I'm going to finish with my promise to Narelle. I'm going to talk about, after the 10 tips, I'm going to finish with the story of my greatest failure. And I'll try and do it, as I always do, in one edit for you all. I uh, could get upset, but we're just going to go through it. So I'm going to talk about my greatest failure and my pathway through it. And that pathway through managing failure, ironically, or perhaps not, led me to this current job. So 10 strategies and then I'm, I'm going to do the dreadful thing. I'm going to talk about failure. Let's do it. Narelle, you're a legend. So here are some 10 mantras for your consideration. If you really are not managing situations well, here we go. One, recognize that failure is emotional and log and understand those emotions. So one of the reasons we ignore failures, we don't speak of them, we hide them, is because they hurt. They hurt emotionally. So think about the emotions that cascade from failure. Embarrassment, shame, anger, blame, sadness. All pretty debilitating stuff. And a 2017 study from the Journal of Behavioral Decision Making confirmed that motivation and improvements emerge when we log the feelings. This is what I'm feeling. We log the feelings. We understand the feelings. We experience them. And then we move through them. Right. So that means we avoid filling the spaces of failure with booze, 
with smoking, with drugs, with 15 tubs of ice cream. So don't mask the emotions, log them, be conscious with them, log them, move through them and learn from them. Two, experiencing a failure does not make you a failure. Failure <laughs> encourages irrationality. <laughs> we go straight to emotion, blame, self-disgust. <laughs> but in many ways, failure is a sign that you're facing your fears. That you have made a decision to live outside of your comfort zone. Now, anyone can live in happiness, right? Anyone can live two margaritas in, <laughs> a big bag of crisps and enjoying Netflix. Anybody can do that. But that bundle of happiness is not going to complete a PhD or enable movement in your career. And indeed, the research has shown if you don't risk failure, then your fear will actually increase. Therefore, it is important to experience from a very early age these moments of micro failure. And another way to express the idea of micro failure is that old cliche, you are stepping out of your comfort zone, right? So it is a cliche, but unless you move outside of what you know, unless you take a risk. And of course, what a risk is, is a risk is a risk of failure. Then you're going to become stuck in your present, which may be comfortable, but is also banal and mediocre. Three, when you fail, look for explanations, not excuses hardest thing to do but if you can take a breath at that moment of failure and force yourself to recalibrate your thinking if you can look for explanations look for reasons for the failure then that will allow you to see the shape of what's occurred and allow you to find a different path so moving away from excuses and towards explanations is also, can I say, the pathway to leadership. This is not a matter of trying harder or working harder. It's about placing your behavior in context. It's also removing the either or thinking in our lives. So if we give ourselves the freedom to fail, then we are living proactively rather than reactively. Hard to do, but important if we can. And I think it was Mark Twain who said, quote, you can't rely on your eyes when your imagination is out of focus, end of quote. So if we work our way through failure and think it through, no matter how the ball bounced, no matter how the cookie crumbled, then we can be a leader in our own lives. Four, oh yeah, ask yourself what you can learn from this. Now I believe in learning, that's why I'm in this job. And there are plenty of much easier jobs that I could occupy. And there's plenty of easier jobs that you could occupy. But easy choices in life don't result in failure. But challenging and difficult moments, choices, decisions in our lives, result in failing a lot. Aim to get to a point if you can, and I get there most of the time, I fail at failing too, but aim to get to the point to respond to every failure with, wow, <laughs> what have I learnt from this? What mistake did I make? What can I learn here? And also, how am I responsible? And what can I do differently? So failures in life are presenting you with an opportunity to learn something. We are in the learning business, so you know what? Learn something. Five, failures demonstrate that you're challenging yourself. The only people who do not fail uh, are the people who remain permanently in their comfort zone, right? So remember, you are enrolled in a PhD. 
what you're, <laughs> what you're trying to do is discover something new. So say you've run those experiments for months and not much is happening. Say that crucial piece of equipment breaks down. Say the statistics that you thought were going so well, the statistician looked at them and went, yeah, nah. All your data, your computer crashes and you lose data. You are not alone. If you ever gather together three researchers, each of them is going to have a horror story that's going to be worse than yours <laughs> and you will feel better. So research is punctuated by obstacles. That's why it's research and that's why it's difficult. But if you get stuck in one of those obstacles, then your research career will be over and you feel a failure and the self-talk commences, you know, how could this happen to me? How could this happen to me? So what you need to do when that moment of failure happens in research is return to the fundamentals. Sleep, exercise, eat properly, focus on your personal relationships and get your professional planning back on track. And look, ask for help. Talk to your supervisor, allow them to help you reflect on what has happened and then summon that expertise and learn and improve. Six, live in the present and look to the future. If we live in the past, then we rehearse all the past failures. The best strategies to manage failure, look failure in the eye. Understand it, manage it, put a line under it, move forward and that takes learning and you've got to try and use your present to propel you to the future therefore planning the best of planning comes from a failure because what failure gives you is a plan to move forward the worst thing any of us can do particularly in a phd program is to just sit in the rage or the anger, or the melancholy, endlessly pulled to the past because you won't succeed. If you're living in the past failures, blaming other people, you will never be successful in your research because you're in the past, not in the present. So if we all continue to rehash what other people did wrong to us, or even what we did wrong, then the past is going to trap us. So the way to manage failure is to use it to plan for your, for your future. A failure is a plan for your future. Failures are a point of decision making and your success is determined by how you manage it. Seven, oh yeah, don't be worried or wedded to what anybody else thinks. For some failures, it's not actually the individual failure that is debilitating, but our fear that other people might know that we failed and we get a bit embarrassed. Now, I probably only have one gift in my personal and professional life, and that gift is I'm not bothered at all about what anyone thinks of me. <laughs> it's a great gift, I'm so grateful I've got it. So when all the name calling and the nonsense and the gossip emerges, I'm not bothered at all. <laughs> One of the great strategies to manage failure is to disconnect your opinion of yourself from the opinion of others. You know, that is a moment of leadership in your own life when you measure your success and your failures by your own standards rather than what someone else thinks of you. Eight. Take the right amount of responsibility. Now, you know that I work from, in my life, an extreme responsibility model. So if something happens on my watch, it is my fault. I take extreme responsibility. But you're not a dean. <laughs> you're a PhD student. So it is important that you take responsibility. It's very important. And you don't blame others. Very important. But you've also got to understand the limitations of what you can control. So, what could you have done? What more could you have done? Be real. 
Be real, and this is important. Could you have worked harder? Seriously, could you have worked harder? Could you have worked with greater efficiency? Now, if the answer is yes, you could have worked harder, then you know what? Assume responsibility and work harder. But the key in your life is to ask a question at the end of each day. And I do this, by the way, at the end of each day. Could I have done any more? Could I have done any more? And if the answer is every day, you know what? I gave it everything. I gave it everything. Then that's not a failure because you gave it everything you could, right? Assume the right amount of responsibility. Nine, apologize authentically. So part of being able to manage failure, as you might have worked out, is being able to learn from it. And we have to recognize that if other people have been hurt by that failure, or indeed disappointed through that failure, then we need to acknowledge the consequences of that failure and apologize authentically. So I'm not talking about the sort of cliched, I apologize for any inconvenience. That's not what I'm talking about. It's about acknowledging the problem, acknowledging what happened, taking responsibility for the part of that failure that was absolutely in your control and own the solutions to make it right. 10. Share the failure. This may seem like everybody's worst nightmare. The whole point of failure is that it's shameful. <laughs> we should be embarrassed, we should hide it. But the way we change the narrative, particularly in a PhD program, is to talk about the failure. And hundreds of people contacted me after Narelle's vlog, the Christmas vlog, admitting which, when she admitted that it was her second try at the PhD and she spoke the words that the first try at the PhD, she failed and she had to pick herself up and it took her a while, but she learned and she tried again and she succeeded brilliantly. So Narelle speaking that truth of failure has had a huge impact on students around the world. And so many, can I say, women have offered commentary and sent applications into us because they want to have a second go. Inspired by that, they've done the deep thinking and they're now ready for a second go. So let's make a pledge today to honour Narelle. Let's share that failure. Let's share it. And it may be with a partner, it may be with a friend, it may be with a family member, it may be with your supervisor or advisor. But also, can I say, be kind and decent and listen to the failures of others. Be inspired in how truly astonishing people have handled the truly dreadful <laughs> moments in their life. Seek out the stories, because I think all of our life focuses on academic success stories, you know, the great success, the great discovery. The fabulous result. But you know what? Probably we learn more from the failures of others when nothing really happened in research. So let's share the failures and yes I'm gonna <clears throat> finish off the vlog today with my story of failure. I was so inspired by Narelle and remain inspired by Narelle and her research and reading that I conducted the vlog today and thinking about how I was going to end it. And I went hard. I mean, I've got hundreds of failures I could choose from, but I decided to go really hard, really deep, and reflect on a truly catastrophic moment of my life. So I'd like you to go through the same process if you can. So here's what I did. Firstly, I looked back on all the failures in my life, and there's been a lot of them. Secondly, I asked of all those dreadful moments, what was the most dreadful? and how was it caused by my decisions. So I've looked for a catastrophic moment in my professional and personal life. And thirdly, I tried to go back into that moment. So I, I got myself back into the past and into that moment to feel it again with intensity and then be able to think through the decisions that I took to transform that failure into a pivot, to move it from a failure 
to a foundation for the rest of my life. And finally, I reflected on that moment now that well over a decade has passed, what I learned for, from it, how it changed me, how it changed me as a person, how it changed me as a scholar, how it changed my daily experience of working and living. Now, I've never told this story before, never. Um, there's a lot of colleagues and wonderful students who shared part of the story with me, and they're still great friends of mine, but the one person who shared the entire story with me is now dead. <laughs> so, this is now even worse, because it's a solitary moment of failure, but it is a transformative moment in my life, where a failure became a foundation for the next stage. Now, Universities are really tough places, right? And they're really tough workplaces. Most academics teach without any teaching qualifications. And most academics either manage or lead without any management or leadership qualifications. Now, most of the time, this lack of expertise results in conformity and mediocrity. Sometimes, it results in suicide and life-changing failure. So my late husband and I decided to take up two professorial posts in Canada. We left, we resigned from two British chairs <laughs> and decided to finish our career in a country that we love and a higher education system that we respected and I still respect profoundly. Now at the point we made that decision, Steve probably had 10 years left of his career. I had 20, 25 years left of my career. So we committed, we committed to this new university. We moved all our goods, we sold our British house, moved all our goods to a storage facility in Canada and lived in a one room bed and breakfast while we were waiting to buy a house in this city. So as you can see, we were fully in. We were in. We were committed. This was our future. This was brilliant. We committed. We made a decision to move to a new country and give our best to that country and that university. That's how we arrived. Great. <laughs> From day one, day one of the job, it was an absolute nightmare. We were invited to meet two new staff members. Now we're invited to meet them not in a coffee shop, but in a bar. And, <laughs> and they started drinking heavily at 11 a.m. in the morning. And they laughingly said to us, we've got you now, you've just made the worst decision of your life. And we sort of replied, were you going to mention this during the interview process at all? Were you going to tell us that this might be an issue? And they replied they simply wanted to add new victims, and that was the word they used, add new victims to the faculty to take the pressure off them. So it became clear as the days progressed that a large group of the staff were day drinkers. So there was a huge alcohol problem. Now I've worked for alcoholics, you know, alcoholism is a problem in university life, and I have worked for alcoholics, but I have never seen an alcohol nightmare like this, okay? We had a large group of staff day drinking, starting drinking spirits at 11 o'clock in the morning. But of course, alcohol never really is the problem, is it? Alcohol is always the proxy for the problem. And the academics were so stressed, they were so beaten, they were so broken down that they used any strategy around them to try and mitigate and manage the burden. And alcohol was the easiest. This burden was caused by a dean. And this dean did something that you never do as a leader or a manager. It's the first great mistake. And if you do it, there's no coming back from it. And what she did was she created an in crowd, her little group of people around her and abused and attacked the rest. So she split the department and created a Lord of the Flies. And this Dean was supported by the hierarchy of the university. They made excuses for her and turned a blind eye to unspeakable horrors. Unfortunately, I became the primary target 
for this Lord of the Flies. I was on 24 hour surveillance, seven days a week. The Dean would continually send me formal emails inventing a new performance metric. Uh, she interviewed students in my class to find if I was doing anything wrong on a daily basis, pull students out of a classroom, interview them about my teaching. It was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. It was also terrifying. And it was a daily terror because no one would help us. Now, of course, we had, and I still have, great friends from that faculty. But, of course, they were too frightened to lift their heads up and to help us so that they wouldn't then become the target. And I understand that. Now, this went on for six months <laughs> of daily horror. Our goods remained in storage and we continued to live in this one room place in another person's house. It was hell. It was hell. And I had failed. Wow. And even worse, even worse, I'd failed my husband. We were both trapped in this career suicide spot. And mentioning suicide, of course, one of our colleagues, one of our academic colleagues, did suicide, commit suicide from, from the pain and the daily horror. So good people, and particularly good people in power, stood by and did nothing. We thought we would be in this job for decades. And here we were, six months in, and it was killing us. Now... I, can, I went back into these feelings and, you know, I, I've thought a lot about it over the years. And when we were in this period, neither of us were thinking clearly, right? When you're bullied, when you're abused on a daily basis, and you know I rarely use the word bullying, but it's accurate here. When you're bullied, when you're abused on a daily basis, what happens is you sort of live in a fog. You're not thinking straight. But then a couple of things happened that cleared the fog. Here we go. So uh, Steve's father, Jeff Redhead, died. He died, right? His father died in a different country. Steve's father died. So Jeff died. And the dean refused Steve's right to go to his own father's funeral. So, so that's an atrocity, and we'll just park that for a moment. So that's bad enough, but that's not the worst of this story. Okay. Steve was informed of Jeff Redhead's death via email from his brother-in-law. So no one in Canada knew. Steve and I were notified via email that his father had died. Okay. Now, only, so only two people knew. And one of the Dean's administrators, one hour after that email arrived, came up to Steve and offered her condolences. Are you ahead of me? So, so, of course, no one knew. And Steve, although absolutely bathed in grief, was a brilliant man and realised what is going on here. And he snapped into action. And I remember it to this day. He asked the administrator with some degree of hostility, how did you know that? How do you know my father has died? No one except Tara and I know it. How do you know it? And she blushed and stammered and started to walk away. And Steve, six foot two, fifteen stone, followed her, followed her right into the dean's suite, and got everybody agitated by saying, "How do you know? How do you know my father has died? No one knows. How do you know?" Silence. Because of course, then you realise how they did know. With horror, they were monitoring our emails. They were monitoring our emails and we had the sign of it. So, of course, what they were trying to do is look for any correspondence where we were explaining to people outside of the university, our friends, about what was occurring. And, of course, we, we didn't do that. We would never do that. That's not professional behaviour. We were in personal horror. We weren't sharing it. But, of course, the other thing that they didn't know is Steve and I, and I still do it to this day, maintain a professional or public email and a private email address. So private, public, and I'd advise you to do the same. So that was the first trigger, right? Okay, we're in this emotional fog 
and yet we suddenly go, right, okay, so this is weirder than we thought it was. They're monitoring our emails. Right. And that same week, Steve received an email to his private email address from a great colleague at the University of Tasmania. Big hi to everyone in Tassie. Uh, and if, as you might know, Steve was very involved in the 1990s in Manchester and youth culture and music and stuff, and it was a big deal. And he made a lot of friends at that time. And of course, still to this day, the University of Tasmania has this enormous youth culture research area and centre. So that's great. So Steve and his colleague in Tassie knew each other very well over decades, they were friends. But this distinguished professor from Tassie wrote to Steve's private email address and forwarded a message from the deputy dean of this faculty we were working in. And this deputy dean had met the guy in Tassie at a conference in the States a few years before. So the deputy dean, of course, assumed that all Australians must know each other because it's a small country, so all Australians must know each other. And he asked the Tassie professor if he could, quote, give me some dirt on Tara Brabazon. Anything you know will help us. End of quote. Now, the professor from Tassie, bless him, said honestly that he'd never met me. He had read my work but didn't know me. What he didn't say is that he was very good friends with Steve Redhead over some decades. And so two minutes after our wonderful Tasmanian professor had replied to the Deputy Dean, he forwarded the entire correspondence to Steve and said to him, mate, I think you're both in trouble. I think you need to get the hell out of there. Let me know if I can help. Now that correspondence happened on a Canadian Friday and we continued to work through the weekend. I was continuing to manage the new performance metrics that the Dean was inventing for me on a 24 hour basis. And then something happened. We, we were working as we do through the weekend and Steve was working in the bathroom because obviously I, I had one desk in the bedroom and he had set up a stall over the sink in the bathroom to do his research. And on the Sunday morning at 11 a.m., uh, he walked out of the bathroom to me and he called it. He said, we've got to get out of here. We've got to cut our losses. We've got to leave now. We failed. We've got to call it. We've got to get out. Now, you, the scale of that decision is remarkable, even more remarkable when you realise that Steve had worked at Manchester Metropolitan University for 30 years and Brighton University for six years. And he was suggesting we leave this Canadian university after six months, right? Now I was stunned by his comment, but you know what, it, it woke me up. It woke me up out of the abuse narrative. And at that moment, we made a decision. At that moment, we acknowledged the failure. We acknowledged that we made a mistake. Rather than pretending that it was gonna be okay, if we can just work harder, if we can just hang in there, it's going to be all right. We went, this is not going to be all right. I have made a mistake. I have failed. And that acknowledgement was a freeing moment. So I said to Steve, I'm going to try and enter university management now. From this nightmare, I'm going to try and get into university management so that no one again will ever have to put up with the nightmare that we have just had to manage. I want it over. Never on my watch. So, we planned, and I immediately the following week applied for a job in secrecy, and I got an interview, uh, luckily got an interview, did the interview in secrecy between Christmas and the New Year. So I applied for one job, and I got it. I was lucky, I was lucky. Now this may seem easy, but I just wanted to share one more horrific moment with you so you can see the consequences of failure. As I was about to go into this hour-long interview for a job that I desperately needed to save our lives, hashtag no pressure, I said to Steve as we were walking towards the building so I could go into the interview, I remember it like yesterday, I said to him, you know what, I, I don't think I can do it. I just don't think I've got enough to do this. 
Now I'm an incredibly confident person. I know what I can do, I know what I can't do, I'm cool with it, I'm really confident, right? But you realize the scale of what we'd gone through, and at that point it was about eight months, of the eight months of daily abuse and horror, that I'd had the stuffing completely kicked out of me. I almost wasn't myself anymore. That's the consequences of that failure. And Steve, this remarkable, quiet Northern Englishman, said to me, and I remember it as if it was yesterday, he said, you know what, Taz, just hold it together for one hour. Give me one hour. Give me one hour of power. Just focus on delivering one hour. And then whatever happens after it, we'll manage it from there. But give me an hour of power. <laughs> I still use that to this day. So I went into the interview. I gave it an hour of power. And I got the job. Right. Denouement. The Dean ended up getting another job at a small FE college in another country. The president of the university who oversaw this debacle was a one-term president and the provost left mysteriously overnight without warning. Now eight of my colleagues in this faculty left the university within one year and so therefore what did I learn? What did I learn from this failure? Call the failure as early as you possibly can. From calling the failure, you can create a plan, a structured exit out of that failure. Now I knew I'd have to get another job. But further, the learning in it, I knew that I wanted to use the experience of this horror to make sure that this would never happen to anybody else so that I would actually enter university management. So the costs of this failure were catastrophic and enormous. Conservatively, it cost us $100,000. Conservatively, it's probably more than that, but that's just raw coin, it costs us $100,000. I still have nightmares about the place. Indeed, the night before I was writing this vlog for you, I didn't sleep didn't sleep the week I was learning the vlog for, the, for the, this particular presentation, didn't sleep well. And obviously then there is the reality that Steve died. Now, we'll never know what caused that pancreatic cancer. It's a cancer where the causes are not clear, but Steve didn't even have any of the correlations for that disease. But the impact of the toxins in a post-industrial city the impact emotionally, physically on his health of that incredibly stressful nightmare in our lives we'll never be able to calculate. So in many ways my failure cost him his health. So this is a catastrophe. <laughs> this is a story of catastrophic failure. But I transformed that failure into the foundation for success. That failure changed me, changed me forever, so that this type of behaviour will never emerge on my watch. If ever I see an academic or a professional staff member being treated in this way, I will stop it. I will intervene every time. Because I have seen the cost if you don't. Destroying people's lives is not acceptable. So that's why in these vlogs we talk about the nature of the university workplace, the lies, the inequalities, the injustice. And I talk to you as leaders because leadership isn't about titles or money. Leadership is about behaviour and ethics and decency. Failure gave me a gift, the gift of this job and indeed the gift of you. The failure cost me money, time, the health, the life of my husband. Cost me also my idealism. 
my belief in the university that this is a, a beautiful vocation of light and hope and aspiration. It's not. The university is a workplace and what I require is professional behaviour. Full stop. I now live in permanent change. I know that every single day, tomorrow, I may need to find another job. That's how I live. But this failure also means that I cherish excellence when I find it. And for example, I have a truly great boss at Flinders University, and I will name him Deputy Vice-Chancellor Research Robert Saint. Rob Saint. He is a man of decency, integrity and respect. And I appreciate Rob so much because I've seen the other side of decay and deceit and nastiness and decay. And that means I appreciate each day. I appreciate each moment of kindness that any human may show me because I've seen the costs of lies and jealousy and revenge and anger and hatred. I've seen it. As Truman Capote stated, failure is the condiment that gives success its flavour. End of quote. So I've told my story. It's time to tell yours. Ponder your failure ponder what you've learned from it and how that failure will guide your present and your future. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out. <laughs>